All right, there we go. We are recording. So welcome back, you guys. Let's take a look at the bear heads real fast. Yeah, I, I just had yours open because we had been talking. So some of you did really, really well. Some of you did uh, a little bit less well, but everybody got full points. Uh, I'm going to point out a couple of common things that I saw just because they were common enough that they kind of apply to everybody. So sometimes I didn't see any of these um, preparatory strokes, like the middle line, the wrapping line, the sphere, um, the axes. I didn't see any of that on some people's work, and it ended up hurting those people's work. This is a process that we were learning, not just an end result. So if all you drew was this final like face, then you didn't really do it right. Uh, if you did these under drawings first and then drew over the top and were erasing as you went so that you didn't have anything left, that's fine, but it's not a bad thing to see some of the evidence of your construction left over in a final drawing, um, as long as it's not for advertisement art or something like that. Um, for our course, it's just fine. So you can see lots and lots of different construction steps on this person's work, and it's helping the placement and size of things. Some of you are way too quick to decide, ah, this is easy and I'll just jump through it, and so your work suffered for it. So this is a good example where I can see some little guidelines behind, and the final drawing, although a little bit wild, I think, looks like nice, confident strokes, and so this is a good balance between the two where I can see the early stages and I can see nice, clean later stages. And so this is a good one where I can see lots of lots of careful lines being made, which I want to see a little bit less of. I'd like it to be a little bit more fluid than that, but not to the point of being scratchy. Some of you guys scratched a lot. So like this one, I can't see any of the early stages. It looks really scratchy and all of them look squished. So they are all taller than they should be and thinner than they should be. And then it also deviates out, out to like characters. Whoop, characters that definitely weren't on the sheet like these ones uh, and I wanted copies so just to mention really quick here's a good one side by side comparison which is nice to see but if you look like at this mouse for instance it looks like just a very careful single line and I don't see the circle I don't see the center guidelines that would probably need to be in there I don't see things lined up three-dimensionally so all of those earlier stages like this are not optional uh, and if they didn't show you what the direction of the egg was supposed to be, then you have to try to figure that out. But in fact, on that sheet, all of the heads that were being represented mostly were right next to an egg or a animal egg that showed what direction it was supposed to be going. Like this one, for instance, you can see it just off frame here. That's the egg and the basic proportions. Here's the final rabbit. So you got to do those early stages. Don't skip them. Your work suffers if you don't. Uh, I don't think I saw salvos, um, so I'm going to have to assign a grade to that when, when I was going through earlier. But yeah, these don't look very close to the originals. We want to get it a lot closer by carefully measuring like I did in the video that we recorded. Um, this one I can see lots of early work, but they're really, really small. They're teeny tiny. Be sure to draw as big as possible and try to use your arm because it's going to cut down a repetitive stress and also just give you more pixels to work with. At this stage, like that one, I have to zoom way, way in just to see it, and it's getting blurry because we don't have very many pixels, but look how much space we had available. So try to draw nice and big if you can. Okay. This is a, um, a kind of a bad example, unfortunately. I don't want to call this person out, but a lot of these later ones, it's very clear that they're using a shape tool See how perfect all those ovals are? They're using a shape tool instead of drawing, and they never actually got any of the faces or details on them, and we definitely wanted some of that. That said, it's a lot of good practice, but we got to see those finished products as well. Okay, so another one, lots of good guidelines. Let me skip ahead just a little bit and see. So this is like, this one looks really, really nice, but I think they probably did the earlier stages, and that was on like a different layer. Um, if you're here, let me know if I'm right, because this looks really correct, even though it looks like nice, thick um, final lines, which makes me think there must have been some guideline underneath here that is now gone. Um, same thing with like the bear, unless they were just literally tracing over the original. Even then, it would be impressive because the line work is nice and steady and confident. 
but even though this doesn't look like it has any of those guidelines, it almost certainly did because that's why it looks so competent. Let's go. So it's, it's okay if it looks like this, like these are very, very sketchy underdrawings and then these are very nice cleaned up ink sketches. Um, do it on a different layer, turn the opacity down or just lightly erase so that you can see your final uh, drawing. That's all you gotta do. Okay. So same kind of thing, guidelines, guidelines. Um, this one was a particularly scratchy looking one, even though it's really accurate, I think this person was probably laboring over carefully adjusting things little by little by little until they finally looked correct, which is like way too much labor. Right. Oh, another person that needs to draw bigger. Draw way bigger. You got all of this space to fill in. Although the steps are pretty competently done here, probably a little bit more pickiness on the proportions and placement. Here's Roberts. So we could actually see he used different colors for his previous steps, like blue for the underdrawing, which is a helpful thing, and left the notes in. Almost none of you left your notes in. I really did want to see what parts you adjusted and what parts you noticed. And so it's nice for, I think, two people left their notes in. So this is a good example of like how to do this process. Rough drawing, lightly, heavier, inked, final drawing on top of it. Okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to see. This one is interesting because it's really competent, but it's not the style at all. It's like not a, uh, a replication of the Preston Blair drawings. So this person just kind of took a look at it and said, okay, I'll just draw it the way I like to, which is not the point. Um, we are trying to replicate someone else's style and see if we can be very, very accurate, which is difficult because on a production, you're not going to decide what it looks like by yourself. You're going to have to copy some art director style. So although this looks really nice and competent, I want to see them copy the original. Right. We got a few with some written out notes. Let me find the other one that had notes. This one was pretty good. That one as well. Let's see, some paper ones as well. Where was the other notes one? I think it was towards the end. Yeah, this one. So we have some notes written down. You can see measurements. That's the kind of thing I really like to see because now I know that you are uh, comparing back and forth and trying to make decisions about what possibly went wrong. So that's good to see. Okay, so just a few general notes that I um, said a number of different times. I will put comments on your homework every time I review it. Uh, sometimes you won't get any, just don't worry about it. I won't comment on everyone's every single time, but if I think of something, then I'll put that on there. Uh, I did want to show you guys my very earliest uh, example of the egg because you know it's nice to see where you start and where you end up. This was actually in a notebook right when I first discovered the Preston Blair book, and these were the first few eggs that I did and then this is the second set and then I was mentioning before I started recording that I actually got a wooden egg and drew the face on the surface of it in pencil and then put it on my desk and turn it around to draw from life so I had more poses than were just in the book but you can see this is how I started out and then here's where I ended up eventually this one's interesting because all of these heads are from the same uh, egg shape and so apparently what I did was draw that egg once and carefully adjust to make sure all of the lines were correct and then did the next subsequent drawings over the top of it on different layers and then move them away or turn them off. So I did like this one very carefully. Um, you can see measurements for the ears and trunk and stuff like that. And then these ones, if I move them, they should all fit, Oop, there we go. They should all fit, there you go. You can see that their head fits within that first egg and this wrapping line goes right under the eyes. This wrapping line goes between the eyes up the forehead. So same thing with this one. If I line it up just right, however I drew it. So I guess this guy's jaw was a little bit shorter or something, but there's his eyes and center line of the head. And then these ones, same thing. So grandma, there we go. And this guy. So in that example sheet, since they were using the same kind of egg over and over and over again, then it was easy to do this, but typically that wouldn't be the case and you just want to draw a fresh one each time, uh, especially if you were drawing more freely. Okay. Uh, this is also, I believe, a sheet where I've got, where are they? All sorts of different bear heads. And some of them, actually all of these, I think, except for this one, are from Imagination. So what I'm doing now is taking the proportions and style of that original bear 
and trying to distort it and draw it from really extreme angles that I don't have any reference for. And that would be the essence of like animation drawing. You're going to have to distort it and draw it from angles that don't exist because you're animating it moving through space. Okay. So just an example of what can happen. And if we go through each one of those just really fast, you can see the wrapping lines underneath my drawings, right? There's one, here's one coming up the side, here's the center line, here's the mass of the muzzle, and you can also see where I've corrected and moved things around. So up close, if you scrutinize, there's a lot of mess underneath my drawing, but if we just take a step back, I've clearly um, firmed up and darkened all of the essential parts so that we no longer focus on those rough passes. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that will give you really, really solid, confident drawings. Cool? Cool. All right, let's look at the assignment real quick. So this assignment is just about making a basic kind of layout design, thinking about something that already exists, like a franchise that you like and then translating that into shapes and colors and positions on the screen. Um, that sounds a bit abstract and it is a bit abstract. And down here in these examples, hopefully you guys know what these examples are from, but if you don't, then the top one is The Simpsons. This is also The Simpsons done in a very straightforward kind of strip style. And then this one is Bert from Sesame Street. Okay. The reason that we can recognize that is because we've got recognizable shapes and colors that kind of represent those characters, the most essential parts of them. Uh, in the case of this top abstract one, Marge's hair, the eyeball could be any one of them. They all have the same eyes, the skin tone, bald head, collar, spiky hair, Lisa's spiky hair. And I don't know what some of these are, but I bet they belong to some part of their costume. Uh, down in this one, which is just vertical strips, each one of the characters is divided into the proportion of colors and of course the position on their body vertically that those things would appear. And that's such a powerful uh, marker that we can tell who they are just from that with no shapes at all. And then in the case of Bert, of course, we've got his dark eyebrow, eye and nose, and this is the pattern of his sweater typically. So it's very easy to recognize Bert there. Okay. So what's going on is that there's something about every character that makes them stand out from the rest of their cast, and there's something about every show's style that makes it look like that show's style. Okay, The Muppets have lots of very round um, eyes and round noses because they're made of felt. They're very simplistic. They're single tone, usually some sort of neon color. And then beyond that, it's just a question of like if they have fur or clothes or anything like that. And of course, the Simpsons all have yellow skin and they have almost identical eyes from character to character. But beyond that, it's all their hairstyles and the little details on their body. So if you can figure out what that stuff is, then you can do something abstract like this and still have it be recognizable. All right. But before we get into details of that, let's look at really quick this article that is up there about the elements of design and the principles of design, two related but not exactly the same uh, concepts. These elements of design are like your ingredients. Okay, You can use shapes, you can use colors, you can use sizes and space and value and lines. You don't have to. You can pick as many as you want or as few as you want but they are the, the essential tools that you can use to make something look like something else or stylize it or whatever, okay? And then there's these little breakdowns about what exactly each one of these things are, which I'm not gonna cover, but just know that this is like your ingredients list, okay? And then these are like your cooking methods or like your techniques for using those things. Um, what we want to do is draw attention to some things and we wanna create a certain pattern or repetition with other things and a certain relationship with certain things in order to communicate stuff. So contrast, for instance, is a way to grab attention. If you've got all one of the same color and then you have a different color, you have contrast. And we're going to want to look at the place where there's, those things are different. Same thing with tone, which is just light and dark. Same thing with shape. Same thing with direction. Any one of these things will make you want to look at the place where there's a difference. So I'm just going to hide 
this for a moment. Give myself a new layer to draw something on. So I'm going to zoom in. Let's just do an example then. So if I draw a kind of round shape and an oval shape and another round shape and another one and another one and a bunch more and then I have one that's just this spiky little triangle. Okay, It's the different thing. It's, the, it's going to be the thing that for some reason you're going to wonder about why is that thing different compared to all these other things. Okay, uh, It also works if you had a bunch of triangles and a bunch of circles. So I'll put in like this. So now it's becoming more evenly distributed. I've got lots of circles and lots of triangles. Okay, And then I'll put in a little square. And now suddenly that square is the odd man out. And it's going to draw our attention. You know what I actually did by accident? I darkened in this triangle too much. So the contrast, actually it's a great secondary example, the contrast was drawing some attention. When that triangle was dark, it was competing for attention because we had a different kind of contrast. We had a tone value contrast. Now, because I've erased out that triangle halfway, but not entirely, it's again competing for your attention because it's the only thing that's like that. It's the only thing that is a, a ghost halfway faded out compared to these darker shapes. And so again, it's competing for your attention. Okay, So that's one thing that you can do. If you want to get attention, make something different from everything else. Or if you want to divide your idea into two teams, then make sure the teams are similar within each other, right? So all circles are not the same, but the circles are making up one team here, and the triangles are making up a second team here. And then I've got this one triangle that's different from all the other triangles. So now I've got two teams and one focus in this little mock-up. Does that kind of make sense to you guys how I'm using those, those ideas? Cool. So let's do another one with one of the other contrast methods then. So they're saying that um, not just shape, but also size. So if we have this, 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 and I'm just going to do lots of different shapes kind of distributed along here. We'll do that. Oop, got to be a little bit better than that. And I'll put one over here. And then I have one little circle. And I've also got a gap too, which is interesting. Doesn't this gap make you want to look at it too, since I didn't fill anything in there? Kind of weird, huh? So the not just the shape and size, but also the the repetition is you know making us think, okay, here's a guy, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Wait a minute. What's going on here? There's something missing there. So even a gap is something that can draw attention. So if I fill that back in again, then now we're back to everything being the same except for this one tiny shape here. And so we start to think, well, what's going on there? Like, why is that one different? So we kind of end up focusing on it. Okay. Uh, last one, color. Color theory is a much bigger topic than we're going to discuss today. But just know that there are lots of ways to um, coordinate your color together to draw attention. And in this case, with contrast, we're just going to talk about difference. So if I get some relatively dark blue color, make a little swatch of that, then I'll change the hue, we'll make something purplish. And we'll change the hue again, we'll make something green. Okay, but on this one over here, I'm going to make it much brighter. Okay, So hopefully you guys can kind of see how that stands out. The fact that all of these, I didn't change the value. Okay, So they're all pretty low, medium dark, medium saturation value. And then this one, this yellow, is much, much brighter. And in fact, I could probably push it farther by saturating it more highly. Or even by just massively desaturating it, make it go way down here makes it stand out a lot more. Okay, So suddenly that's the focus of this little quadrant for some reason. We want to look at that. Okay.
Cool. Cool. Okay. Then we've also got alignment. Okay. We were playing with alignment a little bit just then, but when things are lined up either on an edge or on a center or on any kind of imaginary line, they create a relationship. And that relationship can be used to say, these are all a part of a team, or these are all a part of a system, or whatever it is. Uh, I'm going to bring this yellow back down to something a little bit more reasonable again. In fact, pretty dull once I put it in line with the rest of these. And let's just take one of these, this one, and I'm going to move it out of alignment like that. How comfortable are you with that? Not very. Not very. And it would be even worse if I had them in a side-by-side -side line. Very, very strong alignment. And then I did that. Why am I like this? Yeah, it's almost painful, right? It's like, why would you do that? Ugh. So alignment's one of those where if you want people to think of your design as attractive, you need to consider alignment and don't intentionally misalign things unless you've got a very good reason for it. Uh, typically, if you need to draw attention using alignment, then we would do something like maybe, maybe like this, where they are still lined up, but now they're lined up in a pyramid and that creates a kind of hierarchy. So we've got these three are of equal status. They're all aligned on the bottom. This one is above, but it's center aligned with that center um, object as well. So either we're creating a focus here on the one that's being surrounded. And in fact, we would create a better focus there if we had one here, then we would definitely be drawing attention to the center yellow one. But with this one, the only odd man out is this one up in the air. It's not uncomfortable because it's still aligned, right? But it is different. And so now we're looking at it. Okay. So be careful with your alignment. Usually this has a concept of like underlying grids where you may have heard of some of these concepts where if you've got a certain composition space and you divide it into thirds like this, typically the most interesting thing in your composition, you're going to want to make somewhere around these intersections of thirds or sometimes right in the middle, but that can be a boring choice. Okay. Or if you're going to divide up space, then you might divide it along these thirds to where this is now a dark space and this is a light space and that's how a lot of like document formatting happens. Okay, Thirds are interesting because they're a little bit harder to intuit than fourths or halves but if you do it in like halves it's very very structural but also a bit boring. right? So if you put something right there in the middle or just divide something in half it's a little too obvious to be interesting, so we tend to use thirds. Okay? Makes sense? Hopefully. How about repetition? Okay, repetition is another way to build cohesiveness into your uh, composition. Alignment will usually play a role in repetition, but not always. Okay? So here's an example then with repetition without alignment. So I'm going to make a um, big square shape for our composition. And then I'm going to just put a bunch of stars all over the place. I want to bunch up a few here and there so it's not just an even noise. So there we go. I've got a bunch of stars in a space. Repetition will give us the idea that that is a field far away or something like that then what do you think I'm going to add to this to make it interesting? What's our subject matter going to be? Limited options in space, guys. Spaceships, planets, aliens, the moon. Sure. Where should I put the moon? Downward center. Oh, so like over here then. So I could put it exactly here. This is third third right on that intersection line uh, or I could also make it crescent something like that if I wanted to and then we've got this interesting like um, impossibility that stars can't shine through the dark side of the moon so I could leave them there but the proximity is starting to mess with it 
So I should probably move them over here somewhere so that the proximity is not interfering. Okay, That is the last principle, by the way, is the proximity. Um, so here we've got no grid alignment, right? It's just sprinkled all over the place any old how, but because this is a different shape, we're drawing attention to it in a big way. Okay, We could also start doing things like slicing up the space like this. And now if I get rid of these stars and put a little bit of uh, detail down there, like we've got some land masses or something. And I should probably get rid of this star. It's a little bit too close to that surface. Keep it away so that I get more, more space allotted to it. Now we're starting to make it even more interesting. Okay, do you guys know why I picked that position? Um, well, I mean compositionally. Almost. I mean, it's dividing up the space like this, right? Big diagonal. But look what happens if I repeat that here, here. I've kind of put it on the third line going diagonally across the page. So divide it up just enough of the space to be interesting without being too dominant. Also, I put it on this lower third line if we look at where the surface would kind of hit here. And then here's the center of the moon. Uh, this kind of draws a relationship between the moon and the Earth as if they're related somehow because they're kind of clustered together here at the bottom of the page along with this big open space on the other side of the page. When I drew those shapes just there, so this one that makes the uh, space, right? Can you see that I've roughly divided my composition in half by putting it there? So that's balance. Balance is something that you kind of just have to feel in your compositions, but I've got an almost equal balance of filled territory with empty space without them just being plainly half and half divided in a really easy to understand way. Um, I could do one more thing to actually give a focus to this, which would be like putting a rocket ship up here by itself or something. So if I make this rocket small but complicated, then now I've got a third element that I can mess with and I could rearrange and find a place to um, put that makes this even more interesting. Tell me this though. So I drew those three things kind of haphazardly. Uh, what thing do you find yourself looking at? Why? Yeah, complex. It's, it's got a lot of stuff going on, okay? In our elements, we've got texture. Texture is a way to make a surface complex and therefore uh, hard to process. It makes it difficult to understand immediately. Compared to like this gradient of value, we, we get it. We don't have to stare at it. But look at these little filigree things. They're complicated. You can think of that as texture or you can just think of it as detail. But however you use it, it is a way to get people to look at things. So by filling the earth with these cloud shapes, or if I wanted to fill the moon with craters, I give it an even stronger attraction. So we suddenly want to look at that surface. But if I did it too much, like I just filled the starry sky with dots just freaking everywhere, then it makes it so chaotic that it starts to be a little bit tough to look at the composition at all. Okay, so I'm just gonna like all over the place. It's taking me a while. Tons and tons and tons and tons of dots. Um, it starts to be it and should be impossible in there. So um, if I do that sort of thing, I've gone too far. And then maybe what I would need to do eventually is just make sure that my subject matters are plain. So make sure that the earth has no visible detail. The rocket has no visible detail. And then I may need to use something else to draw a comparison between them, like value. So I might need to like fill them in with a dark color, dark solid color, so that we start to pay attention to those things instead. Really weird to have a dark moon, but yeah. There we go. We'll just say that that's close enough. 
So now I've got a complex speckly space and a relatively simple smooth collection of shapes. And so I should be back to a kind of equilibrium where it's okay to look at these things again. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Then let's see. Proximity. Okay. Last one proximity. This one is like a one. Uh, it's, I mean, they're all psychological, but this one has a strong psychological impact as far as relationships go, typically. Oops, I didn't deselect entirely. So here's our space, and I'll do a few dots clustered together over here, and just kind of some arrangement, and then I'll put one dot over here. Um, what, if anything, do you think about this? Like how? Like we need to balance it out? Yeah. So what if I did that and put like a cluster of dots over here? Does it feel better? I think so. Yeah? What do the rest of you guys think? No? I'll give you my interpretation just off the cuff. This arrangement feels to me like a game. Team one and team two. We're kind of dividing up the space evenly. This one feels like gossip, right? Here's the loner over here, and then here's the group of people who are connected and social and talking about them. In this sense, the space grouping feels more like this, where it's like these people, because they're clustered together, have more power and therefore they cover all this territory. And this person over here feels like they have little power, so they don't cover very much territory. I know that none of that really is literally true, right? But it's kind of how it feels. The closeness of this to the edge of the composition, the wide open gap in the middle, and then how many other things are nearby how many other things. All of those have an effect. Sometimes they're going to be a uh, predictable effect. Sometimes they're not going to be a very predictable effect. So let's try this again. I'm going to fill up the right hand side with more dots, but I'm going to make these dots much more spaced out. Okay. What about now? How does the space feel partitioned? Yeah, it's almost like structural, huh? And this one feels clustered together, maybe afraid. So I don't know why it is, but now it's like an army. Like this army is going to sweep in, and these are like the brave defenders, all clustered together and afraid for some reason. It may just be like recognition of real world scenarios in which you could see grouping happening for a reason, or it might be entirely psychological, like what you think is, is just a projection. But there's no denying that proximity has an effect. It's just kind of down to you to figure out what that effect is going to be and how you would like to control it. And all of those other elements have a bearing as well. So let's do this. I'm just going to play around with this a little bit because I like the idea. Um, I'll put two dots close. And then I'll put a bunch of dots all arranged out here on this side kind of like this and you know what I'm gonna keep them isolated and over on this side I'm gonna make more regimented line of dots like this how about now what does that feel like now kind of looks like the right side is like a more strategic group and the other left side is a little more like relaxed and two in the middle like team captains yeah so I've created a relationship of some kind here in the middle, but I've created another relationship with just the fact that there's some kind of symmetry here. And because we've got a group near the edge and a group near the edge, you start comparing them. You start saying, well, that group looks like this and this group looks like this. And I wonder why that might be. Okay, all of that is to do with 
both alignment and proximity and in some cases repetition right you can recognize that this is a roughly symmetrical breakup of this space except there's this one key difference the alignment's crazy over on the left hand side so it's like what's going on and that kind of question of what's going on is going to be the thing that always attracts the eye and makes you want to look at certain points okay cool make sense yeah. do you guys have any questions about these elements or these principles rough principles really For, for this homework, yes. All right, guys. So just like, do we need to make sure we apply all of them, or just like specific ones? Uh, if you if you don't think about all of them, then you run the risk of doing something accidental. If you don't utilize all of them, that's your choice. Like for instance, you could create a composition that has no lines in it. That would be fine. Or you could create a composition that only has lines and has no shapes, except for the shapes that are created by the lines interacting. And that's fine. It could be black and white and not have any color. It could be all solid colors and not have any texture. Right? There's infinite variety in how you combine these and how many you use. But you need to think about it at least. If you're going to leave something out, leave it out on purpose. Okay? But yeah, eventually, how all of these things combine is going to reflect the success of your uh, composition. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I got it. Okay, let me show you at least one thing that I know. Um, there are a few predictable kind of things, like the attraction that contrast creates. Here's a predictable thing that is usually something you can rely on. If you take your, your space, however big your document is, when you come in and just make a margin, kind of like a picture frame, if you put important stuff way over here on the edge where it's almost touching the side but not quite, you're going to make people uncomfortable. Okay? Like that, it makes people uncomfortable because they're not sure what's out here and then they start to think about that and then they start to look outside the image and that's usually a bad thing. Okay? Um, there are times to do that. So like if you had a character here who's just poking up from the bottom, looking at something on screen like this, that can be a cute thing to do. But see what I did? I, I pushed the, the relevant part of this, and let's just give him some ears down here. I pushed the kind of relevant part, like the eyes, all the way into this frame so that we're definitely inside the, the viewable space and also I cut off the bottom part of his head rather than had it resting against the side okay so if putting stuff in this zone out here makes people uncomfortable what's even worse is just barely touching something to that zone like that okay why oh it's it's really uncomfortable because of a, a couple reasons one, we don't know if it's supposed to be leaving or coming, right? For another, we don't know if it's in front of or behind another object. If we did that with multiple objects like this, is it resting perfectly on top of that? Or is there depth here that we're not seeing? It starts to create ambiguity and a lot of tension, okay? Sometimes that tension is good, right? So. Oftentimes you might have two characters' faces and like their lips are you're gonna kiss or something and they're just barely touching or just barely not touching and that can create a lot of tension, right? Like, ooh, they're gonna kiss, right? That's cool, that's on purpose. But to do it on accident is a bad thing. Don't do it on accident, okay? If you need to have two things like this nearby each other and there should actually be some depth, overlap them and pick which one is supposed to be in front and which one's supposed to be behind. So I would do something more like maybe that and then just erase out uh, this part to make it absolutely clear that the circle is in front of the rectangle and not the other way around. Okay, so this is called a tangent. Try to avoid that. If you have to align multiple people in some composition, so here's a little meeple that I've got. Here's another one. 
Maybe that one's bigger for some reason. Here's a few small ones, right? Don't accidentally place these guys like with one standing on the other's head or just barely touching the other guy's head. That's the bad part, right? This. So instead, take these guys and clearly move them either behind the guy or off to the side somewhere. So this is better, this is better without the arrow, and then even this would be better, although in this particular case I probably wouldn't choose that, but even that is better than leaving him just barely touching. At least we can clearly see that that person is behind that other person at that point. Cool? Yeah? No? Yes. Sensical? Yes? All right, a brief word about color theory then. Um, do you guys know your primary colors from like grade school? I think so. What are they? Red. Yellow. Uh-huh. Blue. Let's do it. Sorry, there we go. Blue. Green. Green. Where are the rest of them? Did I do it wrong already? It should be over here, shouldn't it? Yellow. Orange. And purple. And as you probably know, we've got an infinite variety of colors beyond these ones, but those are your big six, okay? There are a few color relationships that are more likely to cause it to look boring and more likely to cause it to look too intense, so much so that it hurts people's eyes. Okay? If you go straight across this color wheel, you're going to hurt people's eyes typically. Okay? So if we grab red, make a big field of red, and then I stick a green shape inside the red. Ow. I don't like it. Christmas. Christmas. Well, Christmas ideally is going to have some sort of mixture of these things and not just that, right? This hurts. You can get rid of that effect by moving somewhere else along the wheel. Um, and ideally, you should move from the overly contrasted side to one of the neighbors. So instead of green, let's pick yellow and already that feels a bit better okay or instead let's pick blue let's get rid of that or something like blue and although that's still pretty intense it's not as bad as the green one was okay so this contrast is maximum when you go across the color wheel so beware of that okay when it's at a minimum is when you step from one color to its neighbors Okay, so if we take purple, some of you might even have trouble seeing that there's purple in there. Okay, and if I take orange, that just kind of looks fine. Like, not very exciting, fine. Okay, so beware of that. The more contrasted your colors are, the more intense they are the harder this contrast is going to be. This is also at its worst when you're at the top of the saturation and brightness scale. So this corner up here is where the color is not only brightest but also most saturated. That is the worst corner to be in for um, people's eyeball safety. Okay, Super super intense colors are really only suited to like um, cartoons and cereal boxes and stuff like that. Other than that, you should probably tone it down a bit, right? At least come back from that corner towards this third or something like that. So if I place down this purple, okay, let's compare that with full saturation purple. And you can see the difference, like yikes, that's intense. But let me also show some of the other ones. Down here is the kind of muddy washed out zone. Not only is it getting darker, it's also losing its color value at the same time. So this one is kind of like blah, whereas this one is far too exciting. 
So the safer way to go about this is follow an arc like this across this color field, which means that when you get darker, you can also safely get more saturated. Okay, the darker the color, the more safely you can have high saturation. Then if you go the other way, the brighter you go, the more you probably need to consider toning down the saturation as you approach white. Okay, so right over here, there'd be just a hint of lilac left in that. And down here, this is dark and highly colorful, and maybe we can just detect some plum or dark, dark purple from that. Okay, so if you've got a color picker like mine, which is based on hue, that's what this H stands for on the side, the rainbow is over here, saturation and brightness are in this field. You may have yours start here, which I find incredibly confusing, uh, R, G, and B, red, green, or blue centric, or you might have it start on saturation like this, or brightness like this. I always prefer it to be rainbow on a side slider, brightness and saturation in the field if I can help it, but there's a lot of different color pickers. So rule of thumb, the darker the color is, the more saturation you can have if you want to, and then the brighter the color is, the less saturation you need to have, otherwise you get this, which is painful to the eyes. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so if we take this central kind of toned down purple, okay, there it is, and I put this down here, and then I take a kind of central toned down yellow here. And let's just push a little bit towards orange, I think. This is still contrasted. It's still kind of unpleasant, but it's not nearly as unpleasant as if I took the full saturation value of both of those. Okay, so here's full saturation purple pink and then full saturation yellow. Yikes. Okay, so if you absolutely must have contrasting colors, at least tone them down a little bit. Now, this one kind of looks like garbage though, right? So if we actually wanted this to look good, I'd probably take yellow and I'd step around the color wheel somewhat. And I'm thinking I want to head towards orange. So we'll go, let's start from it, go towards orange. And then I can even increase the saturation a little bit. That feels a lot better already. Doesn't it? Easier to look at than it was before. Yeah, okay. There are many other relationships here. Um, just roughly, I think we're going to probably cover this later, but uh, neighbors is a color relationship which is um, fairly boring, but not as boring as just having one color. That's called analogous. Uh, having one kind of color, so we'll draw the shape like this, one kind of color is monochromatic. That's what this whole thing is over here. I never touched the rainbow slider at all. So all those colors are monochromatic. Okay, um, Having relationships straight across is called complementary. Um, don't be fooled by the title. Complementary just means they complete the color wheel together. Um, usually you want to avoid that unless you want high intensity. And then you could also do cross complement which would be what I was describing. Go across but take a sharp left and maybe also a sharp right. So it would be red and bluish green, red and yellowish green, not green. So cross complement. Uh, you can also do a triad. Pick any three like this and use those three. So red, green, blue, purple, green, orange, or what have you. And however much you alter a color, so let's say we start with red and we go around the color wheel a little bit to slightly orange, we need to do the same thing with the other two colors. So here's a slightly orangish red. So the same direction, it would have been yellow. So now it's going to be a slightly greenish yellow. And then third one would have been blue, so it's going to be a slightly purplish blue. And that's a triad. So they work together. They tend to have a kind of medium contrast to them. They're a little harder to use. I prefer to sort of avoid them and instead use a cross complement most of the time.
So that's just a little bit of color theory there to kind of get us started, but we'll, we'll cover that later on. Any questions about any of this stuff, any of these concepts, composition, color, etc.? Cool? Let's talk about shape real quick. Okay? Shape is a pretty simple concept because usually in grade school we all learn how to, kind of how to like draw simple shapes but there's a little bit more communication to it than you probably think. Um, for one thing, the simpler the shape, the easier it is to recognize. So circle, one of the simplest shapes of all, absolutely easy to recognize. Oval, same thing, easy to recognize, although slightly unique because it feels squished. Um, square, same thing, very, very easy to recognize because of all of its parallel sides. To change a square into something lesser recognized, you could slant the sides, like this to create a rhombus, or you could make the sides slant inward to create a trapezoid. These ones are similar to, but more complex than a simple square. Same thing with an oval if you made like a donut or something. So really just two circles, but you know, slightly different than your basic shape. And triangle. Bunch of different standard kinds of triangle. Equilateral triangle has all equal sides right angles and isosceles and I don't even remember what they all are but the more extreme and odd you make them the spikier they tend to look um, equilateral is the calmest kind of triangle that you've got um, these shapes these basic shapes are really it the rest of them are either some geometric um, shape that we have only because we know we need that number of sides or they're a specialty that represents something to us for instance a star is not a basic shape Right? A star is like a five-sided spiky thing that we've come up with because we could go one, two, three, four, five around in a circle and then kind of draw that. But it's got an intrinsic value to it, right? When you draw a star, you're either literally drawing a star in the sky or you're drawing a symbol of magic or you're drawing like an award or something, right? They've got a value to them. Whereas these three don't really have an intrinsic value because they exist so many different places. So that's how they kind of differ. Same thing would be true of like a heart. A heart isn't really a basic shape anymore because it's got an intrinsic value to it. It's a symbol, right? And if you flip it over even, then it's like the playing card spade or something like that. Or it looks like a flying object or something, right? Um, hexagons, pentagons, they're all kind of mathematic. So here's a octagon. What's an octagon look like to you? Stop sign. Stop sign. Yeah, that one does have a cultural um, attachment to it, but you could use an oct octagon in other ways and it wouldn't necessarily be a stop sign immediately. Hexagon most closely associated with like honeycombs and maybe Settlers of Catan if you play that a lot. Okay. Uh, then, yeah, I mean diamond is just the square turned on its side and squished. I can't even think of another basic one except for like a crescent. Crescent moon, another very obvious kind of astrological association or astronomical association. Um, so these are the easiest ones to recognize. Usually if you're going to make something um, more complex you're going to start combining these together. So you're going to make like a capsule out of two circles and a square like this. And so now suddenly we've got this capsule. Or you're going to make a heart out of like two spheres and a triangle. And then that kind of creates a heart. Or you're going to make a, a star out of like all triangles and maybe a pentagon in the middle. A crescent out of two spheres that don't quite overlap and kind of subtract from each other. You know, like this. And then we just fill in this area. So essentially think about these three shapes first. Okay. They have a kind of feeling behind them. Um, see if you guys can, can tell me about it first, and then I'll tell you what the agreed upon kind of trope is for these three shapes. What, do, what does it make you feel to look at a, a circle? What would its personality be if I drew a face on it? Friendly. Friendly, helpless, maybe. Soft, squishy, sure, right? No corners. No surprises, not very stable, maybe a little bit um, 
childlike sometimes. Those are all of the kind of associations with a circle. Okay, so you get a lot of circles in children's programming for animation. Um, you get a lot of circles in friendly, approachable things that should not have any danger. Okay, what about the square? What sort of uh, personality might you give it? Super Meat Boy. What was Super Meat Boy's personality? He was like... Uh, very smiley. Like that? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Friendly is a part of the square feeling. Usually there's a feeling of it being a little bit more adult and boring, though. So Super Meat Boy, I think, gets by on the really cool game mechanics, but usually it's kind of like a slightly over it, but benignly friendly sort of thing. Like, I'm here, I'm not going to cause any waves, I'm stable, right? Big, predictable shape with all right angles kind of does that. If you look at the variants that I drew up here, they both look more exciting in certain ways. Like the trapezoid, I feel, looks a little bit more aggressive, like it's going to smash you. And the rhombus looks like it's running fast to the side or something like that. Okay. So typically the most boring and grown up one is the square. What about the triangle? Uh, I would say it's more edgy. Edgy. So this is, this is going to be our giant anime eyebrows. I'm going to be the guy kind of thing. There it is. Yeah, there he is. I'm going to be the best shape. Nobody's going to stop in my way. I'm going to give her a Naruto headband. Just gonna, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So triangles have spikes. Spikes are like claws and teeth. It looks dangerous. It looks dynamic. Um, no matter what the triangle, there's some element of motion, whatever the predominant direction appears to be. So they seem like they're faster. They seem like they're uh, more aggressive, that sort of thing. And that's the general association. So if you want a character that is childish and aggressive, you might combine these two, right? So what, uh, what would a combination of circle and triangle be? Like that, ice cream cone or teardrop, right? And that kind of looks, yeah, duck. This kind of looks like Phineas and Ferb head that I drew immediately. All right, you might do something like Eve from Wally, -E. like that. Uh, you can also do it several times if you want to. An eyeball shape, right, would be two triangles with a sort of round shape in the middle. Or you can start building them on top of each other like that. I don't know, but some sort of. I mean, this actually is a combination of circles and triangles as well. So it has elements of being dynamic, of being faster, of being maybe more aggressive, but it's also got the friendly kind of child-friendly elements as well. Okay, so just consider that stuff when we start doing designs later on. This isn't going to be as relevant for this assignment, but it's something to think about, that shapes have a language all their own. Okay? Same thing would be roughly true for just pure lines, by the way. Um, if your lines are smooth and flowing and curvy, then they take on elements. Oh, I made it kind of ugly there at the end. Let me try again. Smooth and curvy and flowing and looping. They, they tend to be friendly and playful. If your lines tend to be careful and straight and turn corners, right, then they tend to take on elements of the square. And if your lines are spiky and frenetic, then they take on elements of the triangle. Okay. So this last one looks more like graffiti. Um, the second one looks like a diagram on a chart. And the first one looks like um, curly feminine handwriting in a notebook or something. Okay, So that would be the, the basic kind of association with those shapes just for lines. Let's look at the assignment. Okay, What I want you to do is take some kind of existing franchise and break it down into some basic shapes or colors or whatever and try to represent it abstractly right just put together an interesting to look at image like these ones that has this feeling of belonging to that franchise somehow so then the question would be uh how do i do that okay first you're going to need to get a reference library for that thing so I picked for my example uh, DuckTales because I like that recent cartoon. I also like the old one, but uh, my son and I have been watching it every day and I have grown fond of it. 
And so I've got a bunch of images from just a simple Google search. So here's one of the kids, and that was just some Art Deco thing. Okay, so here's Scrooge and his money. Here's Mrs. Beakley and Launchpad and some comic book covers that they had. Right, and so I've got these because they represent some things that I want to include. Uh, for one, I noticed that the kids' heads are all kind of these rounded squares. Okay, so probably I'm going to need that shape. Also, if you look at their colors, they've got this pretty strong color scheme of green, blue, purple, and red. So that's something that I can use. And then maybe I can also use their secondary shapes as well. Um, the triplets right she's webby the triplets were all identical in the original cartoon but in this one they gave them different haircuts and so this one over here is like a con artist sometimes this guy's like an obnoxious radio show host kind of guy and that guy's like a nerd so why they pick these haircuts for those attributes i don't exactly know but they're different enough that you can distinguish them by something other than just their shirt colors and then they have somewhat different voices as well okay um, so with that in mind, I did some early shape exploration let's see, like this and wrote down those thoughts to kind of get it started. So I've got like, okay, so a bunch of like square kids and then I realized, oh no, it's more like rounded squares. And then I looked at the other characters and thought like, okay, she's like a big rectangle. Launchpad's like a big triangle shape kind of a, a more friendly rounded triangle I thought okay I could make all the shapes kind of rounded because they are all um, protagonists Scrooge McDuck has got his like cane top hat glasses and money as certain symbols so I could just draw him as a top hat if I wanted to but if I didn't the shape of his body is actually kind of like a little triangle a little triangle with a top hat on top when I did that I saw Bill Cipher from Gravity Falls and I thought well I can't do that that's gonna be misleading it's gonna look like the wrong kind of thing so then I started thinking how am I gonna put these things together should I overlap them should I put them in a grid and so this is a bunch of playing around with that sort of thing then in the second stage I started to find things that I liked like for instance frequently you see Scrooge's money bin as like a background like this and so it creates these little hillocks with maybe a bunch of little coins down in there or something and so I could probably use that as a background I'm trying to avoid things like a dollar sign or anything too recognizable but I'm probably gonna need to put in a dollar sign in there somewhere just to kinda get the point across and so I started playing around with both organic shapes like this one and geometric shapes like this one and that led me to an art deco pattern like this or more like the shell pattern that I've got here. Um, that's as far as I've gotten so far in this little example, except that I did mock up a little colorful uh, example of what I might end up at, just kind of playing with it. But this is the kind of design process that I want you guys to go through. Look at your source material, try to extract some shape language, some color language from it, and use it in your final composition. Like, if I was to do this and I didn't use the colors of these guys' shirt, I'm probably doing something wrong, because it's a big part of their their uh, character design and their personality that there are one, two, three, plus one of them uh, in the show. Okay? Does that make sense to you guys? Uh, yes. Okay. So aim towards the abstract don't aim towards reconstructing the thing to be recognizable all right so let's take for example um, well give me an example of something we might all recognize a show or a video game Phineas and Ferb I actually am not so familiar but let me do Phineas I'll do a quick search and just get them on the screen for me okay Phineas and Ferb so these two guys, right, big old nacho head and very, very tall baseball bat shape. I could just reconstruct that, right? I could say, oh, one of these characters is like this, and the other character is like this. But then if I go too far, I'm going to start adding on eyes, right? And 
and God, really, on the top of his head? Okay, sure. And maybe I would start adding like ears or like little bodies or something like that. And before too long, I've just kind of got a shitty version of the character. Okay, I've gone too far then. Instead, try to break it down to its most essential, which I think would just be this big triangle shape and this big baseball bat shape. That's all you would use. What color would you make it? Well, I could make it flesh like their actual flesh, but look at their hair. Their hair is so much more useful. I'll make a red nacho and a green baseball bat, and that will probably get me closer to a symbolic representation of them than I otherwise would have had. So here I'll use green and fill this in. Okay. And I'll get red. And those colors, right, those are complementary colors. They're cross from the color wheel for each other, right? So they have a really strong contrast, but if I lean them up against each other, it's gonna be more painful to look at. If I leave them somewhat apart, it's gonna be less painful to look at, but they're brothers, they're the main characters of the show, they probably need to be nearby each other. We could start adding in other things like the white and orange striped shirt, or I can see on this guy, he's got like purple pants and like a cream color shirt. And that might make it just complex enough to be acceptable. So if I grab purple, and just gonna like fill in this part, and then what's his orange and uh, white stripes? Orange, a bit darker. Let's just do it here. And then also white or cream. Is that starting to look recognizable now? If I get rid of my versions of them. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, But that's the kind of process that I want you to try to follow. Try to get basic shapes, try to get colors, try to get all of the parts that make them uniquely them, and try to ignore how they are supposed to look. Don't like just recreate the characters out of shapes. That would not be very useful. All right. Questions? Are you sure? I'm asking kind of a wacky thing here. Are you sure? Okay. One more little thing just because I want to give you a technique that you can use in most drawing programs. In fact, I think I'll open Krita in a second. If you want to make a shape and fill it in with color, there's usually an easy way to do that, not just drawing it by hand like I'm doing. Okay. One is that in Photoshop, we've actually got a shape tool. You can totally use the shape tool for this if you want to. Okay. But be aware that there are many settings for it and you might end up being confused. Um, the shape layers that it allows will create a brand new layer that has a mask and a fill color and the way that you fill this in is by double clicking on that fill color and choosing a different one okay the way you move it you use your movement tool the way you reshape it though you have to start using the um, direct select tool or the path selection tool and know how to use paths in order to reshape it so i can move this shape around it shouldn't change anything but then I could also grab my direct selection tool and alter the shape to be something different, like a squished half circle instead of a perfect circle. If you don't know how to use that stuff, don't mess with that stuff. Okay, Just use basic shapes and overlap them or something. Um, we can set this though, so don't use the um, paths mode for the shapes tool. That's just going to be very confusing unless you're comfortable with paths. But there is a fill pixels mode. So this is like using the shapes to just color an area on the screen. You do need to be on a layer that is normal, not a shape layer. And now when I drag this out, I can just drop it, and that is a big tan oval. Okay. If I want to try again, let me undo. I need to make my foreground color, whatever it is I intend to drop down. So let's make it purple this time. Drag it out and make sure I'm happy because there it is, and it's permanent. You can also use the basic selection tool. So we've got a rectangular selection tool. If you would like to make a square filled area, you can make your selection and then use a paint bucket to fill it, or you can hit Alt Backspace 
and Alt Backspace will fill a selection with your foreground color in Photoshop. Okay, or you could even just make your selection, grab one of your drawing or painting tools, and make it big enough that you can just paint inside of it like that. That's one way. Uh, and if you want to do this kind of multicolored effect like I've got up here, then leaving this selection active can be an easy way to color it with multiple colors. Because now I can't go outside. Hey, look, I made the Incredible Hulk. Cool. Nice. Okay. Uh, there's also a circular tool, uh, elliptical marquee tool, so you can use it for the same sort of thing. So if I fill this one with like, I don't know, red. And then let's try to make uh, a recognizable character. See if I can manage it. Something like that, I think. And then I'll give them like that. Let's see, like this. Did I do it yet? No, nope, not yet. Let me get blue. I think. Recognizable? Uh, Mario. Mario. Yay, I did it. Let me push it by putting a little circle of white right up there. There we go. I've made a Mario dog tag or Mario pog or something like that. Okay. So you can use those methods if you'd like to. Um, we could also use multiple tools if we wanted by putting down a basic shape first. So on this layer, all of this drawing stuff is on the same layer. If you lock the transparency of that layer like this, then I could use one of these other selection tools like the rectangle tool. And now I've got this area selected so I could paint it without affecting the rest of the ellipse and without going outside of the shape. So I could do that several times if I wanted to. And I don't know what this is. I don't have anything in mind. But oh. Oops, there we go. So that makes for a very, very clean shape because I used all of the, the digital tools to create it. They're absolutely sharp, and I didn't use any brushes or messy stuff like that. So I could have done that with Mario down here to create a really, really clean-shaped character if that's what you want. OK. Briefly, let me switch over to Krita and see if we've got the similar tools. I don't actually remember, so I'll take a look. we go. Make a new file. It's fine. And yeah, we do have shape tools up here. Let's see what they do. So I've got red. Okay, it made an outline only. Ah, tool options are a separate window in Krita. Um, view, maybe window. Trying to see where do I find that window. Probably in view. Tool options. Hmm, I don't see where I would turn on and off that window if it wasn't currently showing. Somewhere in these menus is going to be a list of other panels. But I usually don't worry about it very much, so I'm not seeing it. I don't know. If you don't have that panel, then you can just change your layout to Big Paint 2. And I know that one includes it. But anyway, with the Circle tool, right now it's set to Not Filled. And so if we do Foreground Color, now I've got the Foreground Color filled as a circle. You don't have to worry about all those path things or um, shape layers in here. It's just pixels. But the same thing applies. Here's a circular um, shape with the Foreground Color. I'll change my Foreground Color to like dull green, make a rectangle. Oh, it went right back to not filled again, foreground color. Okay, if I want to lock my transparency on this layer, then I believe it is this checkerboard over on the right hand side. So now if I grab a paintbrush, like that one, and attempt to paint over these, I can only paint where there's already pixels. So you can make nice solid stripey shapes on these two if you wanted to. So all of the same kind of stuff. 
Cool. All right. So please try to make full compositions. Don't just have your characters floating in a void space that is written in the assignment. Um, try to do something like one of these little abstract paintings. And I know this Simpsons one, they are kind of floating in a void, but it's clever, so I included it anyway. But try to make some kind of abstract, recognizable thing and treat it kind of like a game. So don't write the name of the thing right on your screen or anything like that. But when we look at them, we'll try to see if we can guess what it belongs to before we ask you for real. All right? All right, you guys, that's going to be the end of the lecture. And I'll do Q&A now at the end to answer any questions you might have.